Hey everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number 29 of Van Halen Stories. Today my guest is Matt Blackett, formerly of Guitar Player Magazine. For how long was it? 20 years? No, it felt like more than that, but it probably was 15 <laughs> years. They weren't all connected, but a grand total of about 15 years. Right, so you're there, and now you're like the marketing director for Evertune, is that right? For Evertune, yes, and that's a product that I actually reviewed when I was a guitar player, and far and away the most revolutionary product I reviewed in 15 years, and so, yeah, super happy to be working with Evertune, but, you know, still friends with everybody at Guitar Player. Right, right, so that 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 bridge is pretty awesome. I watched a lot of videos on it and how it works, and for Guitar Players, it's, you know... I can see how that become addictive. Like you were showing in a lot of different videos, how, how solid it is. And like, you know, when you're recording, that's such like, it is a timeline thing. It's a, it's how, like, how fast can you get through this? And every time you have to tune, it's such a pain. <laughs> no, it's exactly that. And it's amazing. And it not only keeps the tuning stability, which it does, like I haven't tuned my ever tuned guitars in weeks now, uh, but it intonates so beautifully up the neck. And I was always a tuning weirdo and an intonation dork. And like my tech, Gary Brower, was on the forefront of like exploring that kind of stuff. Buzz Feeton system, the Irvana nut and all this kind of stuff. And when we found this, he goes, this might be what we've been waiting for here. And so, yeah, for me, it's just it's a really fun, creative job, a product I totally believe in. And uh, I use every day. I love all my guitars, but I typically record with Evertune guitars, and if I have to play a gig in direct sunlight, that's the only guitar I'm bringing. Right, right. Yeah, I, I looked at all the videos, and you know, just the part where you were like hitting it really hard, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't bend out. You know, like you were talking. Right. About, you know, just that subtle stuff that that uh, we get so used to just dealing with. <laughs> right. You know? right, and there's no problem with dealing with it. And I love uh, all the records that were made with those guitars that do that kind of thing. I mean, where would Black Sabbath be? without that pitch jump on the low string when you hit it. And so I don't have any problem with that, but this is just sort of a, it's a different thing. And it's a very useful and very musical tool for me. So I love it. Yeah. So there you go. Brought to you by Evertune. Here we go. <laughs> we'll check that out online. I, I really think it's, it's just as cool as you say it. It really is cool. I'm going to have to check that out. In fact, I looked online for guitars that, that have it, you know, already. And there's quite a few different lines. That could there are quite a few. Yeah, and more, more all the time, and so that is that's that's part of my job is making sure that we have more of those kind of things happening. And so you know, it's happening. It's it's interesting because it's you and I both lived through the Floyd Rose Revolution, and the, Evertune will never be able to do what Floyd did, right? Because Floyd, I actually interviewed Floyd Rose himself, and I asked him about that time, and he said it was the the perfect storm of the right product with the greatest artist and the most popular music in the world. So you had the Floyd Rose system, you had Eddie Van Halen, and you had this kind of music that everybody wanted to be able to play. And he said, that will never happen again. And he's totally right. And yet there were, you know, we have our detractors. Floyd had his detractors too, right? They just thought like, oh, it's a really invasive mod. It changes the tone. I don't like this. You'll ruin the vintage value of this guitar. All right. Fine, fine, fine. You know, um, people say the same thing to us and I'm going, all right, well, I just want one tenth of the benefit of the doubt you gave to Floyd Rose. That's all I'm asking for here. Right. And in a sense, they're similar. Yes, this is an invasive mod. Yes, this does change the way the guitar sounds. It changes the way it responds. I admit all that stuff we do. We're very transparent about that. But it does. This guitar will do things no other guitar can do. And that was true with the Floyd, too. Right. So it's like, if you don't want it, all right, that's fair enough. But it does what he said it does. Right. And so the same is true with Everton. It does what we say it does. Just do people want that? Yeah. You know, some do. Maybe not on every guitar. I'm not even asking for that. Just one. Just put it on one. <laughs> that's how I see it. You know, like, you know, you probably you got to like you said in some of the videos, it takes a little bit of getting used to the just the subtle differences of it. But. Yeah, there's a learning curve. There is. And yet there's a learning, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever tried to restring a Bigsby guitar or something, you know, or, or restring a 12 string. Like there's a learning curve with a lot, lot of instruments and, and some of it's a little bit of a pain. With Evertune, it, 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 I don't find it to be a pain, but it is different and it does need to be learned. And But once you learn it, it's very logical 
but it's a new way of kind of looking at things. So um, you know, Eddie, you know, that, that that was the thing about Eddie, you know, he, he helped Floyd get that, that fine tuners on there and all those little right. tweaks that he did that got it to the point where, you know, we see it today. And, and it's, it's an amazing system that's done an amazing thing for guitar. Like you said, totally. everybody, not everybody wants it. Not everybody is all into that, but, uh, but a lot of people are. <laughs> well, and it changed the world. And and you, it, again, a Floyd guitar can absolutely do things no other guitar can do. And that's just fact. And so if you don't want that, that's great. But, you know, it's he changed the world. And, and yeah, and Eddie was a big part of that. And, you know, that was just an incredibly exciting time to be a guitar player and a, a gear nerd and all that. It was just uh, the, this idea of solving problems that have existed for a hundred years. It's very exciting. I think I'm not an engineer. I, I can't do it, but I definitely appreciate it when other people do. Right. Right. And then one of us, as I say, segue into the, your, uh, this tribute issue that you did with a uh, guitar player. This was, you know, your issue that you put together in your article in there. And I was re reading back through it again. You know, you had mentioned online that when I had posted something that that was your issue. And I really, it, you know, you blew me away on that. I just, you know, at the time it was so, uh, rough at that moment, you know, still with Eddie being just passed and so emotional. And what you said in there about him, you know, the, the title was A World Without Ed. And the way that you went through that and kind of took out what would happen, what would have happened had he not done this, that, or this, you know, how it would it be? Where would we be? You know, there's such a huge chunk of stuff that if you don't really think about it too much or you're, you're you know, you're not like you did reflecting on it. Uh, you, you just don't realize how much he really added besides the music. Well, I mean, it's, he, he did it so effortlessly that it's kind of easy for us to take it for granted. Sure. And now it's, there was a great quote in there from my friend and a former teacher of mine, Lyle Workman, who said, as soon as he heard it, Van Halen, he knew this was a language that had never been spoken before. And now everybody speaks it. And I thought that was a really cool way of describing it. And yeah, I, I it's, it's funny, like the, the story behind how I got to do that tribute is an interesting one because I got the news kind of like a lot of people did, right? So my phone starts blowing up and I was just devastated, you know, and I'm crying and I'm just in, I, I got a call from a friend of mine from high school I hadn't heard from in years, right? And he's the guy who drove me to the fair warning show, okay? Because I didn't have a driver's license at that point. And so he just called and I pick up the phone. I know why he's calling, right? And so we're there commiserating. And then he said, he goes, hey, are you going to write about this? And I'd been out of the magazine game for a couple of years at that point. And I said, no. And I said, I mean, I'm going to write some tribute like on my Facebook page or whatever, but I'm not going to do any magazine stuff. Right. And then I said, unless they ask me. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. A half hour later, my phone rings. It's Chris Gapolitti, a guitar player who I've never met. Right? I certainly know his work and everything. And I have a lot of respect for the guy. I never met him. And I pick up the phone. And so we just talked for a while. You know, and he goes, how are you doing? And I said, man, I'm not doing well at all. You know, like I'm devastated. I, I and we're so we're talk, talk, talking. And he goes, well, he goes, um, I hate to turn it towards business, but he goes, I got an issue that I need to do. And I've been asking around as to who should write this thing. And everybody says you. And so I was just, I was floored by it. Right. So humbled and, and just flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thanked him for it, but I said, I, I don't know. I need to think about this. You know, I need to think about it. And, and, and again, this is like an hour after getting the news or something like that. And I was just numb. And so um, I was talking it over with my wife and I was just saying like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this, you know? And I was just so bummed about the news. And I said, you know, it's, I never got to do my story on him, you know, and like, I, I feel like the reason I got hired at Guitar Player Magazine was to do the greatest Eddie Van Halen interview of all time. And I think I could have done it. I just never got that, that opportunity. And so, but yeah, my wife, she's very kind. And she goes, maybe, maybe this is that opportunity. Right. Maybe this is the story that that's the reason you got your job. 
And so I'm thinking like, okay, you know, no pressure there. Right. And, um, but I called him and I just said, yeah, I said, I want to do it. Um, and so, I mean, you read the story, you saw all the moving parts with that. Okay. It was 20 interviews. It was, it needed to be the greatest thing I'd ever done. I was grieving, like seriously grieving. I'm sure you probably went through the same thing, but like, this was like a family member. This was like a beloved pet or something. That's how much I felt this loss. And in the midst of that, I got to wrangle 20 interviews. I got to write the greatest thing I've ever written in my life. And I had a week to do it. One week. Okay. I think it was like probably nine days, but the first day and a half was just completely lost and I didn't get anything done. And so, um, so anyway, so I just went into panic mode with it and started to think like, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And I knew I didn't want to do the stuff that's been done so well by so many other people. Didn't want to talk about, oh, the first time we heard eruption. Didn't want to try and say, here's how you get the brown sound. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do any of that. But then I didn't know what that left, you know, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to, what am I going to say on this to make it what it needs to be? And so it was, this has happened many times in my career at Guitar Player. It was like one of those, it's not even the middle of the night, but it's just as I'm going to bed, I will get a vision for the story. And I know that I just need to get up right then and just start writing. And um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's going to be a great visual for all your uh, followers here. But um, I get up naked, go <laughs> into my studio, start typing this out. And the thing that I thought about was a world without Van Halen. It wasn't even a world without Ed. And I'm not even positive I can claim that. That might be a Scapoliti thing. I did a world without Van Halen first and just I, I got the whole vision like I it, it, it's strange how this happens but I can kind of see it like I'm gonna we're now living in a world without Van Halen but what if we always had to live in a world without Van Halen like you know what would our world be and suddenly I'm going like I don't think that story has been told I don't think anybody's approached it exactly that way and you know the, the stuff I talk about is the stuff we all know it's not like I invented anything here but it was, it was my way of saying, this is how huge this is. This is how profoundly this is affecting us. And if you don't get it now, and I suspect most people who are reading it did get it, but if you don't get it, maybe this will tell you exactly how profound this is. And so I just started going, you know, stream of consciousness. And um, again, my very kind wife comes brings a blanket and puts it over me. And so it's just, again, magazine articles are kind of like sausage. You don't want to see them being made. You really don't, you know, but um, hopefully you enjoy the finished product. And so, um, so that was, I got the, I got the intro and then I kind of knew how I wanted to end it. And then it's just, filling in all that stuff in the middle, which was not simple, but I had so many great people to talk to. And there were so many great stories that I just sort of knew it was going to work. Um, and, and yeah. And then, you know, I, I just agonized over the thing. I panicked every day over it. I went through it, went through it, went through it, and then finally sent it off to Scapoliti. And he was so cool. He was so supportive with this because he knew that it was a big deal. Obviously he knew that I was going through this grieving process. Like we all were. And, um, and then he, he just, he knew like he was going to be the guy to kind of shepherd me through this, which he did. He did in a great way. And it's cool. And that's, I've actually still never met him face to face, you know, but I feel like I know him and I love him just because of how much he was able to help me with this and just the tremendous gift that he gave me to give me the opportunity to write this thing. You know, and and it's the last thing that I've done. It was my mic drop moment. You know, I'm just going like, no, you know, how am I going to write about the rhythm guitarist in a band? I don't care about when I just did the Eddie Van Halen tribute story. 
I like what you said when you said uh, you were talking about Hendricks only gave us a certain number of years, and then you had, you know, you're you're relating how long we had actually gotten Eddie Van Halen. You know, I think everybody thinks, gosh, 65 is so young, we thought he'd live to be 80 or whatever. And, um, but you're right, he had such a really, even though he did have starts and stops, he still had a pretty profound, long career. Yeah. With a lot of material, a lot of stuff, and uh, yeah, when you compare that to other situations, you know, you're you're right. There's not very many people that have that kind of have had that kind of impact over that many decades. You know, right. in, in any situation, you know, very few. And to still be hugely relevant throughout all of it, um, you know, there's certain records I like better than others, but like, you know, they, I think that's part of the reason why we. We love Hendrix and the Beatles and Led Zeppelin so much is because they didn't really stick around long enough to do anything bad. Everything was great with them. Whereas most bands that stick around a long, long time, they're gonna they're gonna do some stuff that's just kind of not as cool. And he was still playing at such a high level. He was still so impossibly creative and and was still just the greatest guitarist on the planet. And it's like, all right then I'm, you know, I still mourn the loss. I still grieve this, but I'm, it, it very quickly turned into just gratitude where I was just so happy. And, and I think even though I, like you, I've binged on his music so many times over the years, you know, like you talk about going down the rabbit hole. I've gone down that rabbit hole many different times. I think I might appreciate it more now than even when I was a kid or something, you know, it's like, it's a, it's sort of a deeper appreciation. It's, it's what, you know, you, you, uh, you know, it does inspire you to go deeper, you know, and I think that's one of the things when I started this, that I, I was trying to figure out wh where I wanted to go with it. And I kind of found out I wanted to go wherever it took me, you know, and who, you know, whether I would be with the people from Pasadena and learning more about their early days or whether I'm learning about more about your article and, and this kind of thing. There's really so many facets to it that I can go down the like your side of it. You know, obviously we go down that rabbit hole a lot of times. We go through the, the inspiration of Eddie Van Halen, you know, the whole like people who are, doing things, their careers today. We, me and Chris Gill talked about how neither one of us would probably be doing what we're doing today. Had it not been for Betty Van Halen. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, I, I said that in the article too, like to everybody reading this, we wouldn't know each other if it wasn't for Eddie Van Halen. We wouldn't play guitar. You know, it's my neighborhood. Everyone started playing guitar. It was like the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show moment. And, and it, it was crazy. And then, and that was the thing that kept us going, even if you didn't realize it, you know, because it's like, it gave rise to all this other great music. Then there was ultimately a backlash against that music, but it still kept us together because it's like, no, 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 we're team Van Halen here. We're not going anywhere. And, um, they really did. So, they did survive that. You know, they're one of the few bands that, that they kind did of, that kind of went through that period and we're able to yeah, they didn't go away. A lot of bands had to get resurrected after that. Like, you know, the, the grunge movement, a lot of which I really, really liked. Uh, I didn't like it at the time. I was very threatened by it. I would always be threatened by anything that wasn't exactly <laughs> what it was that I loved. Um, so I didn't get it when it first happened. I, I gained a huge appreciation for all those Seattle bands and everything that was kind of like that. But they did kill off a lot of talented bands in a sense. And, um, and yeah, and you know, again, it, maybe that's fair. Van Halen killed off a lot of talented bands, right? They were, you think about, you think about the you huge bands. said it though in your article, when you were talking about in the very beginning of your article, you were talking about the seventies bands and how that transition happened. When I was thinking about that the other day, you think about Foreigner and all those bands prior Kiss you know, Kiss was in that bad situation they were in in 81, 80, you know, when they're doing The Elder and all that. And then Van Halen's kind of like just shooting through the stars at that point, you know. So there right. was this, this weird thing where those 70s bands kind of got a little bit of backlash, too, because of the disco move and then the whole... No, movie. they totally did. Uh, and they, you know, the, the term they would put on them was dinosaur right. rock and... And, you know, again, I understand it. And I'm old enough now that I just find these things kind of amusing. But, yeah. like, you know, I think we, we know what happened with Led Zeppelin. But bands like 
Aerosmith, they were probably going to collapse under their own weight anyway around them, but Van Halen just absolutely crushed that. And Ted Nugent, you know, Ted was headlining. He was like the, one of the biggest stars in the world disappeared after that. And, and so this whole thing, you know, Dave said around that time that like the, and this was still in the seventies, but he says the seventies guitar heroes are dead. Edward Van Halen is the guitar hero of the eighties. And that sounded like so futuristic, right? That's crazy. That's like space age stuff, you know? Well, Dave was totally right. Now the eighties feel like though that's the dinosaur era, but, um, but he was totally right. And it was, um, it was, it was very interesting. And like, you know, it's again, it, it, change is good. And I'm super glad that a lot of these bands are still around or came back or whatever, because I think the music was legit and, um, and I'm fans of a lot of those bands. And I don't like, I didn't like the hate that came with the grunge movement, even though that's very common, you know, the, when punk happened, then they hated on whatever, you know, classic rock and then grunge happened. They hated on hair metal. And, and so I guess that kind of stuff just always works that way. Um, again, I'm old enough now that I just find it kind of amusing. I, I, I tend to just look at it much more like a, an anthropologist sort of, you know, and just like, okay, so what is going on here? And, uh, yeah. but so, it's, it's good. It's good that we're all still around to talk about it. And, uh, and I am happy that I don't hate nearly as much music as I used to because I just I don't know. That's I think it's a waste of energy. I'm going to ask you about the, the Ross Halfin photo. What was the decision making on that? I mean, it's, it's, I had very little to do with it. They showed me a couple different covers, and that's the only one that I even considered. I I love. I'd never seen that photo. Yeah. And and that appeared on uh, on Brad and Chris's book too. And I'm going like you guys. You took my photo, <laughs> but it wasn't my photo. It's like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't take it. And, um, and I like Ross Halpin a lot. I think he's a great photographer and just seems like a cool guy. I've met him just once on a Metallica shoot, I think. But, um, but so the Chris Capolitti and I talked about this a little bit and I just said, man, I think it's gotta be that one. And, and he, he had a question that he just wondered if the image was like kind of, ghostly or something right and 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 like because his eyes are closed and all this and i just said i don't get it that way you know i think he's just it's blissful and it's amazing and i think it's magical and i'm just going just do it and um and then and you notice there's no cover type or anything it's not like they're going also in this issue new mesa boogie you know and I pushed for that, even though, again, I have no control over these things at all. But I just thought, like, no, if we're going to do it, let's do it. And the most famous guitar player uh, cover, aside from the first Eddie Van Halen one, was the Hendrix issue that had also had no cover type on it. It was just Jim. That's it. And um, and so it was, um, yeah, it, it's, he, again, I, at that point, I was so exhausted from doing this. If they'd chosen an image that I didn't think was cool, I would have said something. Um, I mean, and again, I, I had very little control over this stuff. And I was very honored and humbled that they even asked my opinion. Like they let me proof it and everything, which was really cool. And I just, you know, I just want to catch mistakes uh, if I can. I told Scapolitti that I did. I did certain things in this article that we've never done. I've never done in guitar play. Like our rule was always you use the, the artist's first and last name the first time you mention them. Then it's just the last name after that. That's it, right? We've never violated that in all my years. I did in this one. I kept calling him Ed. I kept calling him Eddie. I kept calling him Edward. And I said, I just think he deserves special treatment. I didn't do that for anyone else in there. Yeah, another, another great Halfin photo, I think. That maybe it's that a, Halfin, I'm not sure. Yeah, and that that could be as lows, but I and I don't know either. And that's funny. I haven't I haven't seen that that opening spread in a long time. That's it's really cool. It's like it's. A, I really appreciate you talking about this because I this was it was such a huge thing for me. It was such an important 
thing to do and try and get right. Uh, and I hope I did. I always said I, it needed to be the best thing I ever did. I, I think it is, and I hope it is. Um, and, and then I thought it was important to just walk away after that. You know, I still write and I still do stuff, you know, and I do a lot of that for, um, for my job now and, and I'll do things for artists or manufacturers, but I don't, I don't attach my name to it for that kind of stuff because I'm just going now nah, that it needs to be just that. Like you want to like George Costanza end on a high note, you know, thank you. You've been great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, I went kind of down the rabbit hole on this photo at one point because I was trying to figure out, well, first when it was, you know, obviously 78, but one of the things that I noticed when I ended up getting a giant poster version of this, because I guess some of the, I don't know how that the big posters ended up out there, but there are some full size posters of this. And uh, he's wearing the Van Halen necklace in this picture. Okay. I don't know whether you know this, but there, the timing on that is kind of a weird thing where nobody really knew exactly when they were given those. There was all kinds of, you know, like it was at the end of the year. It was, in the middle of the year. Anyway, I found out it was at the Anaheim Stadium gig in in September. And then they went to England in October, which is only four weeks away. So that photo was in England, Ross Halfen took in October of 78. And okay. they, had, they had just gotten those necklaces in that four weeks before at this stadium gig. And yeah, I thought it was good. I never noticed it for all those years. I'd actually seen this photo. I had never really, you can't really see it very well, but it's there. Okay. And uh, it was just a way to kind of like time capsule when that was and when these other events had happened. You know, this, that home, it was a homecoming gig. Their big, the parachute gig. Remember where they parachuted in? Right. And that's the same show uh, that they were given these necklaces before. And it was kind of like, I think it was before they were platinum. It was like just a few weeks, but they were going to go platinum. So they went ahead and did that. But yeah, that's one of the unique histories behind the image. But that image is, it. I think it's, gosh, got to be one of the best of all times. I mean, I think it's one of the best of all time. I totally agree. And it, it just, it gives me chills, you know, and it, it, it makes me emotional to see it because I hadn't seen, it. I, I didn't know that one. I'd seen a ton and, um, and so that's why I liked it is because it was just, you know, it's not the one of him with the um, sort of star guitar where he's jumping and all that, you know, which is an amazing shot. Like that's might be the best shot, but like it's been done to death. It's been done a lot. And so this was new and different. And I was so happy that it was going to be on the cover of this magazine because I just felt like it needed to be. And I wanted it to be, you know, he's so famous for his smile and his grin and everything, right? It's part of what we love. That would have been so wrong on this issue. I wanted serious, deep, and maybe just a little melancholy. And maybe that's me projecting that on it, it probably. But um, but I get that from it. You know, there's so much emotion in that photograph. I poured so much emotion into this story that... In my mind, it it, it kind of all worked out, you know. It worked out, and 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 again, I ended up being very happy with it. And I was, as I said, exhausted after doing it. Uh, the the line I do is from um, Apocalypse Now, where uh, Martin Sheen says, uh, "I wanted a mission, and for all my sins, they gave me one. It was a real good mission." And when it was over, I'd never want another one. And that's that's what I said, and that's what I mean, you know, to this day. And again, you know, it's Steve Luca there told me, he goes, man, never say never. You know, you might want to do something. And they, but you, okay, here's what's cool. It's cool, but it's horrifyingly sad. They offered me the Jeff Beck tribute, okay, when he passed away. And, and again, I'm not going to say I took the Jeff Beck passing the same way as Van Halen. It was kind of too soon. And Eddie was my boyhood hero. Jeff Beck was like an adult hero of mine. And he's a total hero of mine. I love him. The interview I did with him, I think is one of the greatest days of my life and one of the coolest things that I've ever done. But A, I wasn't positive. I wanted to be the obit guy. 
right? I don't want my, you know, people I know in the music industry to get nervous when I call them up, like, uh oh, wait a minute, you know? And, um, and, and, and then I just thought like, no, A, I don't think I'm the guy to do it. Not like I'm the world's greatest Van Halen historian, but I, I certainly am more of a Van Halen historian than I am a Jeff Beck historian, uh, despite my deep love for Jeff Beck's music. Um, but then I just thought like, no, I said, I said I was done and I think I need to be done, you know, with, with no bitterness, no anything. It's just like, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I feel the same way about Bex that you do. I, I, Eddie was a boyhood hero. And as I got older, I appreciated Beck more. You mentioned this in other interviews, but seeing Beck live was your epiphany. And it sort of was mine too. But when I, and I didn't see him live, but I saw him on that Ronnie Scott's video. Oh yeah. Ooh, and I kind of, you know, this is wow. You know, I yeah. mean, I always knew he was awesome, but to watch the touch and the feel and the whole thing that he does, is something mm -hmm. that you kind of have to see it. Yeah. And, I mean, I loved his record that he did with the well, Flash, you know, when he did the People Get Ready and all that. Sure. That was one of my favorite favorites early on, but and then Guitar Shop and all that. But but I wasn't like hardcore, you know, like I knew every song, like I do Van Halen and every little song. Right. No, I wasn't either. And and you know what's funny is that if I ever got my Van Halen interview, I was going to ask him that. Like, you, you talk about Clapton. I get it. I definitely get the Clapton influence. You hear him play the, the Crossroads solo and you're going like, oh, yeah. And then there was, I think it's the Cream Farewell concert or something where Clapton demos a lot of his uh, licks and tricks and shows how he uses the wah and that kind of stuff. He's playing the SG. And when I saw that, that's when I really got the Van Halen connection. Like, I'm pretty sure Eddie must have seen that because I'm going like, whoa, no. You take those licks, you supercharge them with the brown sound, and that will sound a lot like Van Halen right there. And so I got it. And yet he, you know, famously didn't talk about Hendrix. And I'm going like, yeah, but you got a couple things from Hendrix, right? I think, I think it's fair to say that. Like, we all got dive bombs and this kind of stuff from Jimmy. And and so I just, yeah, I, I, I think we can assume there's at least a little bit of Jimmy that seeps in no matter what, just it's because. A, he's you know, Josh, you know, Josh Obrick, uh, Josh Obrick, an interview that he liked Hendrix. Yeah. <laughs> well, that. you know, it's funny because he just, he, he didn't talk about him a lot, but I'm, I'm about halfway through the Steve Rosen book on Van Halen now which has some fascinating stories. I mean, that guy, you know, he really was there like before any, you know, he didn't do the first big interview, but he did a lot of stuff and they used to hang out and like, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing the kind of stories he can tell. And that's the first place I've really seen the Jeff Beck influence talked about. And he said, Eddie did talk about it and just said, yeah, I understand why people say I listen to Jeff Beck and he goes, I like what he does with this and likes what he does with the bar and likes this and likes that. And it's like, okay, thank you. You know? And, uh, and again, you know, it's not for me to tell him what his influences are, but like I had a, I had a similar thing interviewing Ingve Malmsteen where Ingve always talked about Richie Blackmore, Richie Blackmore, Richie Blackmore and Paganini. That's it. Right. And I'm going, no dude, Uli John Roth, you know, or as we knew him back in the day, Ulrich Roth, that's where you got your trip. And so I kind of tried to get him on it, right? And I always had a good relationship with Ingbe. I He was never a jerk to me. And I, I really dig the guy. And I just, you know, think he's a monster player and hilarious. And so I said, all right. And I said, so um, you talk about Richie Blackwell. And I get that. You know, you talk about Paganini. I get that too. The dude you remind me of is Uli John Roth. And I said, so what's up with this? Like, you don't talk about him. And he was so cool and he was very candid about it. And he goes, man, and he goes, oh, the first time I heard him, I thought this might be the greatest guitarist I've ever heard in my life. And uh, and he goes, but I was already going down my road. I already had my style. And he goes, so no, he goes, I love his playing, but Uli John Roth did not inform my style. And I'm just sitting here going like, all right, fair enough. Like I hit him with the question and he answered it. And um, I always wanted the same opportunity to be able to pick Eddie's brain 
about that kind of stuff. Like, okay, so if Jeff, if Jeff Beck didn't influence you, what do you think about his weird noises and his whammy bar stuff and these things that you clearly have in common, right? I'm not saying you got it from him. I'm just saying you guys are kindred spirits. Like if I really had to say like, who was Eddie Van Halen most like, it wouldn't be Clapton. It wouldn't be these other guys, right? And, and, and not talking about people who came after him, right? But um, in, in my mind, like from the guitar god thing, it would be Jeff Beck. He has the most in common with Jeff Beck. Crazy note choices. Um, amazing whammy bar work, right? Killer harmonics, like doing stuff with harmonics nobody's ever done. Tone for days. Like you can say that about both those guys. And um, and so anyway, I, I never got a chance to ask him that. And uh, and I, I can't even say I'm right. I, maybe what... Maybe what I'm really saying is what I love so much about Eddie Van Halen. I love a lot of those same things about Jeff Beck. I really do. Well, yeah, the you know you were talking about the uh, it's the hand tone. You know, it's like with Beck and Eddie. You know, everybody talks about Van being their hands, right? So much of you know, you know Beck so much hands. You know, it's right. so, so connected. And, and Eddie was very similar that way. People always talk about playing his rig or whatever. You know, I had the rare, the rare opportunity to play the guitar he played on uh, Women and Children First, the Chris Holmes Destroyer that he borrowed for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I played that through a JTM 45 and the original 78 cabinet from the tour. All three of those, right? And when I finished, I was like, yep, it's it's, it's the guy. <laughs> The guitar's cool, you know, it's cool, and so is the amp, and so is the cabinet, but, it's not, you know, I'm not Eddie Van Halen, you can just, you know, take that to the bank as soon as you stop. Right. <laughs> so many people have said that on here that have had a chance to play his stuff, you know, other than you, the obvious ones like Ted Nugent or whatever that, that have said it before, but other people who had opportunities to play it, uh, Steve Brown, people like that who've had opportunities to play his rig and play his stuff have all said the same thing. You know, it's just what a disappointment. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, it's funny the Steve Vai said the same thing. I don't think I put it in the story, but that they, they, they would hang out after, after Vi left David Lee Roth's band, they became friends and they'd hang out. And so Eddie would come over to a studio and they spin tunes. What are you working on? And all this kind of stuff. And so if I had his rig, there which is as steve Vai as it gets he passes the guitar over to him doesn't sound anything like steve Vai. it sounds exactly like eddie van halen and and you know you've seen the footage of him playing through a bandmaster backstage or something and all that he sounds the same he right. sounds exactly the same even, and uh, even those interviews with rosen you know where he's kind of sometimes he's playing a pig nose or whatever and it right it sounds just like eddie van halen on the record I know. Well, now, and it's just, and it's, you know, it's, it's so cool and it's so amazing. Um, again, it was, he, even though he was always sort of chasing after the gear, it was clearly never about the gear. And, and then I liked a lot of his, a lot of his sort of different tones. Like I love the tone that we all love, you know, but then my favorite clean tone of all time is the women in love intro. And that's that funky strat with a Dan Electro neck on it. And uh, then he played like a 12 string on pound cake. And and Brad Talinsky has like all that stuff. He knows where, like what all that stuff's about. And George Tripp's another guy who's great at that too, who knows what guitar was played on what tune and how he did it. And, um, and so, yeah, I just, I get a tremendous kick out of it, but it's, I've seen him, so many times he's played through very different rigs many times over the years. It's always the same one note, you know, it's him. So you, you did medium. I did. You had, yeah. You had a chance to, where, where was that at? And what all, what was the circumstances? I know it was brief, but what was the whole situation? Yeah. I was working at Seymour Duncan. And so he was coming with the Fender custom shop guys to do the, the, um, Frankenstein uh, replica that they did, the one that um, sold for like 25 grand or something. And um, and so uh, I was at Duncan. I was their new products manager. Seymour was going to be winding pickups for him. And 
So we're all on high alert, you know, and uh, and so they roll in and um, and he was not in good shape then. This was like in the dark years for him. And um, and so there's just that. And yet for me, you know, it was sort of a weird time. And like I, I, I even though I was the new products manager and this is, quote unquote, a new product, I kind of wasn't involved in this and i would have loved to have been way more involved but it kind of just didn't work out that way and so i remember sitting up there at my desk and i knew he was in the building and it was just driving me nuts you know and i'm finally just going i can't take it i can't take it and so i walk downstairs and i go into like the boardroom there and there's nobody in there except for eddie van halen and so i introduce myself and he comes over gives me a big hug and uh, and we just start chatting. And he was he was incredibly cool, even though, and, and I say this with zero disrespect at all, but I mean, like, kind of hammered, you know. And um, and I think that was true the entire time he was there. Um, but didn't matter to me at the time. And so we're just talking. And, you know, it's the story I always tell where I said, uh, we, I've been a student of your trip since 1978. And he's going, you're not a student. You got 12 notes, just like I do. You can do whatever you want with them. And so I'm just laughing. And then we're, again, just talking. And uh, I said, you know, um, you and I have never met, but we have a pretty good mutual friend in Steve Lukather. And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, Luke's cool, but he's too serious. (laughs) Okay. I don't know how well you know Steve Lukather, but serious is not the first word I would use to describe that gentleman. Okay. And so... I, I, I talked to my brother after this and he goes, what'd you say? And I said, what do you think? I said, I agreed with every word that came out of his mouth. Right. I know you're right. Yeah. And, um, and so he was cool. And then I got to watch him play that day. And so they had a half stack in the testing room and he was testing pickups. And so he'd go in there and it was just guitar straight into the amp. And the amp is just loud as hell, right? But no effects, no nothing. And he's killing it, right? And and again, I'm not saying that to be a fanboy. I'm just going like, no, I don't care like how he was talking before that. He played just beautifully. And um, and it was just, it was amazing to watch him, you know, again, from three feet away, just to watch him do his trip. And, um, and so... He played for a second and then he would just hand the guitar off to his guy and he'd walk out. And so I followed him out and I said, um, so no good. And he goes, no, that one was no good. And I said, what are you listening for? And he goes, the harmonics. I can tell instantly if the harmonics are there. And so I kind of wanted to say to Seymour, like, can I have those pickups that he doesn't want? Because they sound pretty good to me, you know? And, um, and so there was that. And then, Again, I had just a couple interactions with him and he was cool. He he would tell a joke, you know, he he made a joke about my shirt that I was wearing that picture that you've seen, you know, it's like I have kind of a flamboyant shirt. Um, And so he made a joke about that. And then, and then he just walked up through the offices on like the second day. And um, so he came up and I'm there working and I just sort of look and it's like, that's it. I'm on the phone. Right. And I said, Hey, I got to let you go. And I just hang up and I said like, Hey man. And he goes, so this is where you work. And the joke I always do is I said, yep, this is where the magic happens. And he sees my EVH phaser that I have on my desk. And he's going like, I've got one of those. (laughs) Really? And, uh, and so I told him I only use it with the script switch pushed in. And he said the same was true for him. And I'm going, okay. So, this is the greatest day ever, right? And, and there you go. And then I asked him to sign a picture for me. So I had a really cool picture. And it's just him there burning away. And so it's it's a dark, it's a live shot and everything. But so the lightest part of the picture is the maple fretboard on his guitar. And so he signs it right on the fretboard, you know? And it's like, okay, there's a prize possession. And... Um, and I think that was it. I think that was it. I never, I never saw him. I, I saw him play live a bunch of times after that, but I never talked to him again. And then 
I was doing a story that was kind of a rugged story to do. It was on the EVH brand and I was doing it. It was going to be a cover story for a guitar player. And they're insisting that we do this story on the brand, but they won't let me talk to them. And so I was really bummed. Right. And it's like, you know, I'm not bitter anymore, but at the time I was super bitter because he clearly had a deal with guitar world where they got exclusive access to this guy and we were not allowed to talk to him. And I was just over it. You know, I just thought it was stupid and it's, I, I respect the work that they do. My work would be very different. Why can't I do this? And I'm doing this story on the brand. It, the story will be 10 times cooler if I can just talk to the guy. So what are we afraid of here? And yet there was just no, no access, no anything. And so I was there working on the story and I was really pissed, right? Really just bitter and like, you know, why, why me? Why am I the guy who doesn't get to talk to him, right? And I was really just angry about it. And um, so I'm there working on the story and my phone rings and I look and on the caller ID, it says Van Halen, comma, Edward. And I'm going, okay, it's going to happen, right? Like, it's on, it's on. And so I have my little recorder there, you know, like the Jazz Obrecht thing, you know? And so I just start recording and I pick up the phone and I said, uh, Matt Blackett. And the voice on the other end of the line goes, hey, Matt Blackett, it's Matt Bruck. And so it's his guy calling me from Eddie's phone. I still don't get to talk to Eddie. And so, again, it was a long time ago. I, I've let go of that bitterness, but I was really just disappointed. And I just wanted to do the story on him that I'd always wanted to do. And, um, and, and, and again, I don't want to overstate it because again, I'm grateful for how everything's gone. I'm super grateful to have done this tribute story. I just kind of wanted to talk to the guy. I thought I had some interesting questions for him. I thought I could get some stuff that maybe hadn't been gotten. And, and that's, that sounds arrogant there because the, all these people were mentioning did great work with this. So probably I couldn't have gotten anything new, but I wish I could have tried and I would have given it my best shot. Sure. I mean, I think that's uh, anytime, you know, I interview anybody, it's the same thing we we're talking about before we got on here. You know, I, I always peruse what's been said, talked about beforehand to see what else we can, we, we can go. Obviously we can do all the, all the great stories and things like we were just talking about, but you know, we're always looking for that unique insight that we want to try to find. Right. Uh, something, you know, and I think that, you know, you did that in the guitar player magazine and, and, you know, one of the things you mentioned in there that, that kind of struck a chord with me was when you, when you said it was our Ed Sullivan moment, everybody that was uh, 10 years, our senior, at least when I grew the people that I played with when I was younger and I was playing with older people, they were all, that was the thing, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. But for me, it was Van Halen on Don Kirscher's rock concert. That was it. That's what did it. You know, you were at the show in 81 Tell me what that was like in 81. Uh, well, I mean, the the first tour I saw was 1979. And yeah, I still have the shirt. And by the way, this shirt is an original from 1984. <laughs> I cut the sleeves off because that's what we did back in 1984. I don't know why it still fits me. I must have gotten a huge shirt then because I cannot fit into my 1979 one. But it's so I'd seen him in um, I'd seen him in 79, uh, did not see the first tour. And then my family moved like in 80. And so I kind of could have gone to women and children first, but didn't. And then went to 81. And at that point, I'd been playing guitar for a few years and really knew like we are seeing, we're seeing the greatest here. This is, this is the greatest guy ever. And every single thing he did was just elevating the state of the art at this ridiculous level. And then of course, when fair warning came out, the, again, it, it was, it, it was like when you heard eruption where you're going, okay, this doesn't sound like rock music. This sounds like a spaceship or something, right? Like, I don't know what I'm listening to here. Well, the intro to mean street, we're going, all right. So th this is not fair. What's going on here? You know? And it was, it was better and meaner and 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 just the, the tone was so great. And yet for as much as everybody's 
considers that sort of like a dark album and an angry album. And in some ways it is, you know, it's got a lot of stuff that's really happy go lucky, you know, so this is love and all that. And, um, and so, so I went to that show and I was, and, and I hadn't seen that many concerts in my life at that point. Right. I was still pretty young, but I'd seen a lot of big bands, you know, I'd seen a lot of my favorite bands. So I'd seen Rush and I had seen Journey, who I was a big fan of. And I'd seen um, ACDC and like, I'd seen, I'd seen some good shows. And I'd seen Van Halen too, right? Nothing prepared me for this where it's, you, you several times in your life, you might be lucky enough to just realize I am seeing the biggest band in the world right here. As soon as they hit the stage, it was just clear. Like, no, this is the biggest, greatest band in the world. They had the biggest freaking sound system. They had the biggest lights, you know. Dave was just the greatest front man ever. But the guitar was so loud and it was so amazing. And you heard everything. You heard everything that he was doing, you know. So every tapped harmonic, every everything. Right. So and, it, it wasn't deep in the mix. It was up way up. Yeah. And which is typical of the Van Halen show. I've never heard it buried in the mix. But this one, I just remember, like, it was the loudest guitar I'd ever heard. It was the greatest tone I had ever heard. And it was just everything that I wanted to be. And um, and he was just so cool, too, right? He was just, <laughs> he had the cool factor, you know? And again, the smile and the grin, that's all great. But he was just cool, like, not even just a rock star, like a movie star, almost, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, it was... It was incredibly exciting. And then the next tour was kind of the same. You know, again, nothing nothing is quite as magical as the um, the Fair Warning Tour, but the Diver Down Tour was incredible and great set list. And then the 1984 tour, you know, the, this one was an amazing set list because they, they hadn't done Jamie's Crying for a while. They hadn't done some of the tunes to make room for like deeper cuts, which was always great. It was great to hear him just do, do the hits, man, play Jamie's crying. And, um, and so, yeah, so it's those fair warning and diver down. I was living on the East coast at the time. So I saw those in Hampton, Virginia, and it was amazing. Uh, 1984, I saw at the cow palace and Van Halen has a proud history at the cow palace in Northern California. And it was just, there's something about that place, you know, even though it's kind of a dump, it's like a really good dump. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's something about it. There have just been magical shows there. And, and that was one of them. It was yeah. incredible. And so, you know, and then I saw them every chance I got in the same years and they were always good. They were just a great live band and they were amazing, but it's like, that's a different thing. And it's again, the, the band that truly changed the world was that one that I saw in those Dave shows. You know, of course I'm a Dave guy primarily, but I love Sammy. And of course I appreciate his, his, you know, his style and how Van Halen changed, you know, it was fine for me. You know, I went to monsters of rock. I saw 84 as well mm -hmm. with David. So I saw both arrows and, and then when Dave came back, Oh seven, I was at the very first show. Cause I didn't know how long they would make it. So right. <laughs> I went to the first show. I figured it'll be a good show. And if it's not good for a couple more days after that, then I'm I'm good. So I, I did see that, and that was a that was actually one of I thought Roth was on his game. Yeah, yeah I, I think it was the last time he was on his game, and I agree he was good. And then he, it's just I don't know what happened. And everybody loves to go. He can't hit the notes anymore. No, as far as I can tell, he sings everything too high, and it's weird. And he just kind of started to sound. Sound like a dog that just got his tail stepped on or something. I don't know what it was. Maybe he had like a, like a, you know how some singers will get like a, a spot in their voice where they can't quite go there anymore or something like that. It's like almost maybe, like but you know, it certainly wasn't about the upper end of the range. And, right, right, um, right. and I, I didn't get it. And, you know, I saw, I saw those tours and I agree with you that uh, the 07 one was good. And then I saw at least one or two others that I didn't like as much. And it was still great to see Eddie and it was cool. I didn't go to the last one where they were playing like dirty movies and stuff. And even though I, I wanted to, because I'm going, man, I've never heard him play those songs, but I just, 
I don't know. I was at a point where I just kind of didn't want to go there. And so I didn't. And I guess there's part of me that kind of regrets that, but then I'm not super big on regrets. And I'm going now, maybe, maybe it was for the best and maybe that's okay. And I know what I know that I saw him 1979. And I mean, that was at the Marin Vets Auditorium, which holds 3000 people or something. And if you see the famous Fresno footage from that tour, this was right around that time. I don't know if it was before it or after it, but Dave tells the same stories and everything. And so it's the exact same gig. And it's it's amazing, you know, just really cool. So I saw him in a small venue there and then saw just life-changing shows after that. Then saw a lot of just awesome party shows after that. And I forget, you know, I counted one time, but I think I've seen him like 17 times or something. Yeah, right there with you, I think. Yeah. What was the guitar he was playing on the second tour? Was he still playing the star when you saw him? You know, I, I can't remember it. I, what I remember is a Bumblebee guitar. And so he definitely played Bumblebee. And then he still had uh, the black and white Frankenstein at that point. Right, right. And so if he played the star, he may have, you know. But again, this was like the second concert I ever saw. And yeah. I was so overwhelmed. It's difficult. I remember certain things very vividly. Other things are just a complete blur. And um, and again, it was many many years ago so um yeah i don't know but again i just remember i just remember when he hit the stage it was the loudest guitar i'd ever heard in my life you know and i'd seen ted nugent like but no <laughs> this is the loudest i've ever heard in, and just amazing that's crazy man that that uh i was gonna say in 84 you know that i remember specific things like you do i have like little like pockets of good mem like memories that I really remember. And one of the things that I remember is where I was sitting. You see the Panama video where they show some live footage from that show. Yeah. And that's kind of like was my view. So I really, that kind of, every time it comes up, I'm like, is that where I, is that our show? You know, yeah. our show was early. It was, uh, it was in Birmingham, Alabama in January. So it was right, you know, a month, uh, less than a month in. I had just came right out and hit us pretty early on. So yeah, I was pretty excited. I was 16 or 15. Yeah. 15 actually my I dad, mean, dad took me there you go i mean it's it, nothing can affect you like what your favorite stuff affected you when you were 15 years old oh, yeah and it never will and yeah, people ask me because i'm still in the biz like you are and like the you know do you is there new music that you like and i'm going yeah there's a lot of new music that i hear that i like uh is there anything that's gonna stick in my brain or hit me in my gut no, it doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. And there will be a ton of guitarists who I really like these days. Um, and, and and again, they, they're capable of doing things from a technical standpoint, not even just from a shred standpoint, but I'm thinking of a guy like Matteo Sassato or these kind of players where it's like, I, I don't even understand how you do what you do. And it's amazing. And you play beautifully. But is there ever going to be a tune that hits me like hear about it later right is there ever is anybody going to write a song that is going to be part of the soundtrack of my life and maybe not and that's nothing against them you know it just tells you that i'm old and and you know you you, you can only be young once and so um I and so know. i guess i don't know though you know you when you're when you're mentioning that and and i'm thinking about why why Eddie Van Halen was different than most people is because his solos were within hit songs. You know, one of the things that I was telling you earlier when I was talking about Harvey Mandel was that Harvey Mandel said in his interview, the reason that, you know, Eddie Van Halen dominated the tapping technique was because he was in a hit band that was on MTV that had nine, nine million people's viewing, you know, and, and, and the context of what he was inside of with his technique gave him this huge, swath of influence you know and right. we don't, when you think about uh, one of those newer guitar players like tosin or whoever you're not gonna likely ever see those guys have a hit song like panama <laughs> well and the, and the biz is so different now yeah, 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 yeah. that it, it's it, it probably is impossible and yet yeah again you know it's i hear i hear songs that i like you know and like i listen to polyphia and like 
those guys are monster players and they seem like they know their Van Halen, right? Clearly a lot of that stuff is coming from the Van Halen tradition. I love the way they play. Um, and you know, like, uh, my niece, uh, she told me she likes that band and it's like, okay, well, that's great. You know, I, I think it's awesome. And I, I fully support them, mm-hmm. but like, yeah, can there be this sort of social cultural <laughs> impact? anymore and i just don't know i don't know i don't know when the last time we had a song like that really was and um and 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 again i'm not i'm not an expert on these things but i'm totally open to it so like if if somebody can tell me or if it's if there's just a song that's everywhere right and you just can't get away from it and you love it i i i'm i'm all ears like let me know I, i would love to I'd love to hear something like that because I know how it changed my life when I was in that impressionable stage and it was a beautiful thing and it was just so cool. And again, you're asking me like, what was it like to go to the show in 81? It's like whatever it was to go to the greatest show you've ever seen. Everybody there is happy. Everybody's on the same page, right? Everybody's smiling at one another. There's like this electricity with it and and you know it's funny i i felt that at some shows since then and some of it is with bands that i didn't even necessarily relate to quite as much like i've been to i've been to u2 shows and i am a u2 fan uh but i've been to those shows where i'm walking around and i'm going this is the happiest crowd i've ever seen in my life like these people have never been happier than they are right now and that's infectious it's amazing and i love it and same thing happened at a Dave Matthews show. And, and you know, it's, I'm a fan. I think the guy's a good player and whatever. It's, but I, I don't know. I wasn't a super fan or anything. Got tickets, went to the show. Blew my mind. Like, A, the band was great. Uh, and that drummer is just off the hook great. But it was the people. The people were so cool and so happy. And that's what reminds me of, like, the greatest shows that I've been to. And... And so, you know, if there's music that's doing that nowadays, I hope there is. I don't know. It's well, there, there I, I won't is, go anymore. There is though, you know, like uh, I I had stepped into the uh, the world of the Struts, which I which is a fairly new rock band, right? The Struts are okay. kind of like, yeah, 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 like a, a Stonesy vibe, you know, with mm-hmm. a little bit of Queen mixed in, maybe a little bit of English vibe, right? And I went to one of their shows, and it was it was I was like wow, their crowd is just insanely into this band. I mean, you know, I, maybe I'm just old and I just didn't, you know, know. But yeah, it seemed like I was just like, this is one of the best shows I've seen for like 25 bucks. <laughs> I mean, that's great. No, that's really cool. And I find that inspiring. And, um, and you know, it's what we need. It's what we need. And like, it, it's, it's really too bad that it's as difficult as it is. Like that was 25 bucks. That's great. Okay. You're not getting into a Taylor Swift show for 25 bucks these days. Right. And um, and again, I'm a Taylor Swift fan, but like when you get that huge, you, you're not an artist anymore. You're a multinational corporation. And, and, and again, I did, this is nothing against her. It's just, that's gotta be rough. You know, it's gotta be rough. If like Taylor Swift is your favorite artist and you have to pay five grand to go see her. That's not cool. And and we never did that. And like I, I don't have the tickets anymore, but I bet you that 1981 Van Halen ticket was like 12 bucks or something. You know, it's like crazy. And everybody got paid. The band made money. Like the people in the venue got paid. Somehow it worked back then. And so I so I'm glad to hear about that stretch show. And um and and just that their their fans are happy and they got in for 25 bucks i think that's great because again this is it's what we based a career on that's what i said i said like i couldn't believe that i saw a show that that was that was it was at a smaller venue in nashville you know maybe 1500 people Mm -hmm. and and it was a rabbit you know it was like like our our fans from back in the day it was that kind of uh positivity and group uh community kind of thing Mm -hmm. that we had back then i I just didn't know whether you could still have that with the way that the social media is today and you know everything before you go and, you know, it's all that. You talked about that before. 
about how that's changed things. <clears throat> you know, because we just we all watch the same TV sh channels. You, if you were up late, you saw the same Don Kirster's thing I saw, right? You were right. Uh, yeah. professional or whatever. We're all watching. That's how the Beatles thing happened. Everybody saw that. At the same well, time. yeah, everybody watched the exact same thing at the exact same time. Right. And now it is, it's, it's much more diffuse and, um, and yeah. And then, and there's, there's far less mystery about it, you know, like Van Halen really had a lot of mystery about him early in their career. You know, there were magazine articles and stuff, but like there weren't that many photos flying around. You didn't even really know what these guys looked like. And, um, and it made it incredibly exciting. And, uh, it's funny as I run an Instagram uh, called Forever Run Chain 1981, and, and it's a photo thing where I just find the most rare things I can find. And for the the fact that we didn't see these photos, there were so many photos taken of Eddie Van Halen that I see a new one every day. I mean, I've been doing this for years. Right. I've been doing these photos for years, and I see something new every day. I don't know. I don't know how he took the camera in his face that much. It was insane. Right. It's, it's just amazing that 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 far back to 78 on, you know, there's still. Stuff. Yeah, seriously. Analog photography. And it, it wasn't simple back no. then. But no, people it's... people realized it was important, I guess. And uh, yeah, sure. I sure they did. Yeah. And, you know, and, and good. Good for us. And <laughs> I, I still find it to be a source of inspiration you know not necessarily the photographs themselves but just the the music i was just talking to a friend about this and we were talking about just the song structure that most of a lot of van halen songs just did not have a standard song structure at all this was not intro verse chorus kind of stuff like some of them seem like they start with the chorus or they start with a bridge or they start with a guitar solo and like who does that who did that? And yet it all worked. It worked. And now I don't think anybody would even be allowed to do something like that. Right. And, um, and yeah, it's it, again, like the, there was so much chaos, just beautiful, delightful chaos with those first six Van Halen records. And, um, and you, you never knew what to expect. The record would come out, you had no idea what was going to go on with it. And yeah, it just, it, again, it was incredibly exciting at the time. I'm amazed at how well it holds up. It holds up as well as like, you know, my favorite bands are the Beatles and Queen and Led Zeppelin. And I mentioned Rush and, and it, like this holds up every bit as good as all that stuff, which I think is the greatest Greatest rock music of all time. You know what? You you mentioned that. Um, well, I'll just tell you about that. You saw the Nuno. Did you see the Nuno Rick Beato interview? Yeah, I did. Okay. So in that, you know, he talks about not giving everything away, you know, not coming out and doing a lesson on that part that he did that everybody loved so much and not giving all the, all the, all the cookies out, <laughs> you know, like before it even came out the door. You know, and that it led to this kind of viral, sudden, sort of like what we did back then, like when Jump was going to be released, they talked about it, but they, it was like they pushed a button and boom, it was there. You know, that one, it, right. it was, I, there, it was so anticipated, I think because there was less things to anticipate, you know, I mean, like less demands on what your attention was going to be on. Mm -hmm. We were all kind of focused in, like you said, on sort of the same things, and that really made those group experiences really, we always talk about Van Halen people being on the same page. It's because of the experience was so, we were so tied to it everywhere, no matter where it was. Yeah. It was the same. We all went and saw the same show with the same bits and the whole same thing. You know, we talked about. Well, they, they always had the same bits because Dave right. did the same shtick every night. But nobody knew so that, right? <laughs> we, we totally saw the same shows. But no, you're right that it has, there was this sort of collective with it. There's this kind of hive mind thing that I always just really liked. We have this, this sort of secret language, this unspoken language. And, um, and that's something that I really appreciate 
about this. And it just shows you the depth of this. You know, there are a lot of bands that were really good bands and people don't talk this way about them. People can't do this. There aren't, there aren't, you know, for a lot of bands that I really, really like, there aren't a podcast like this. And, um, and so that's the, that's what I've always known. And that's what I tried to convey in that story of mine. And what you and I are talking about is that this was, this was special. We knew we were witnessing something that had never been done before. And it was happening before our very eyes in this incredibly beautiful and exciting fashion. And then now with the benefit of hindsight, you can look back on this and just go, man, we were right. Right. It, we, plenty of things you could go like, oh, I kind of thought it was good, but now I realize that kind of sucks. Right. <laughs> this is not that. It's like, if anything, it's better than we thought it was. And um, for me, that's just, it's incredibly inspiring. It's what has helped me process the loss of this guy because, you know, when when he first died, I couldn't listen to Van Halen at all. And then I would try and it would just absolutely devastate me. And then... Then I just realized I don't want to be that way. And I, I want to transition from in just incredible sadness to gratitude and to be grateful for what we had and what we still have and, and, and to move forward with that. And so I did. And so then I tackled a couple songs that I never had the balls to try and learn before. And they would be like, I'm the one, uh, Girl Gone Bad. And these kind of things, you know, like I have, I have a pretty good repertoire of Van Halen tunes. I can't do anything like note for note, but like, you know, I could do it. I played in a Van Halen tribute band. And, and so like, I know what I know, but those were sort of like Holy Grail tunes for me. Right. And so I decided to try and learn them. And what I found was a, I, I have better technique now than when those songs first came out. And so like, it's like kind of a little bit more capable of getting closer to it. But B, I just realized like, wow, I'd forgotten how much of my style was based on Eddie Van Halen. Right. So then when I'm exploring these three note per string licks and everything, and then kind of, I can kind of do it, you know, and not perfect, but I can kind of do it. Well, why is that? It's because of him. Right. It's totally because of him. And so it was very inspiring for me. And and those songs are so rugged that if I don't practice them every day, I lose it. Right. Yeah. That's at the upper echelon of what I'm capable of. But they're so much fun to play. And um, and again, just to be reminded, like, oh, yeah, that's where I got that. Oh, yeah. No, that's where I got that. You know, the reason I do these 17 different things it's all because of him and uh again talk about gratitude you know like i just i, I i'm totally grateful to say in 88 i just watched it today i was going through some clips in 88 monsters of rock i uh i hadn't really watched a live solo of that i just found one online today and i was watching how he had that constructed at the time you know because back then he would do 15 minutes you know by yeah. himself. and uh there was when you when you add it up at the end of all that solo that he did, there are so many different kinds of techniques and things he does. I mean, it's like gotta be like 50 different kind of things that nobody really ever did, you know, or you know, the tapping, the harmonics, the then he started doing the double tapping both, both right. at that point he was he was doing that, you know, of course everything else he'd done was in there with cathedral and everything else you know there was a time when he was doing 15 20 minutes on his own and and it would be all different <laughs> all off the cuff kind of you know still kind of off the cuff one of the things that i discovered going back through eruption i was trying to a couple of friends of mine were were trying to nail down when he started to make the transition you know with tapping in particular but if you listen to his recordings in 76 live and you hear 77 middle of the maybe a year part it's quite a transition that happens in that year between you know he was still very 
limber and quick with his with his left hand but but he gets into this whole other thing by the time he's in the middle of 77 you know and then they I, most people think that he started tapping around the summer of 77 and then by october it's on the record but when you hear eruption on the record it's an eruption that was never really repeated live ever <laughs> there's like a part after every time on the uh like the bootlegs there was another section after he tapped that final what he does final in the later de- days but there was another whole section you know that he had and then there was there was all different stuff in front of it so I, that one he did on the record is kind of like a one-off and i don't know that I, they said they didn't edit it so maybe he just self-edited it that day and it was just a little shorter maybe i i don't know but that's that's actually really interesting and kind of fascinating and uh yeah, well, you you are the sort of archaeologist of this <laughs> thing, right? So you're figuring out exactly when he got the necklace there, exactly when the tapping stuff came in, and uh, trying to figure it all out, man. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, also, you know, there's a, a whole other part of Eddie Van Halen that I think you you know you were talking about when you saw him there at the office. You know, there's the whole thing when you get to see his hands in action up close. Did you notice, you know, the strength of his hands, the any of the any of the physical attributes, the size of his stretch, anything like that when you were there? Yeah, it, that they they do they look sort of like unnaturally big uh, because you see that picture. You know, I'm not a super tall guy. I tower over him. I look like Shaquille O'Neal sure. next to this guy, and and yet his hands are big and. Oh, yeah. One of the things you'll notice in this picture that I, because I, I have on my wall, is that if you look at his is a tapping hand, right? Compare it to his fretted hand, it looks pretty meaty. <laughs> you know, I mean, doesn't it look fairly large compared to his fretted? Yeah, hand? I mean, I guess, yeah, I, I haven't really thought about it. If you look at um, it close, you're like, yeah, his fretted hand actually looks pretty big. You know, well, he. Um, yeah, his hands did look big. They certainly seemed strong. Like his, again, just you, you watch him play and he has such, he really can just throttle the guitar. And like it was, and these aren't super heavy strings or anything that are on there, but it's he, it's a very muscular attack, very muscular approach to it. And then he still, again, you know, it's like, I, I don't want to speak to his overall health, even though it didn't look great to me, but he, was still just cut to the bone, you know, like it, not an ounce of fat on the guy. And Sammy in his book talks about like he thinks that is what sustained him, where he's going like there's just no reason that this guy didn't die on that horrible tour that they did together. And he says, it's, I think he's just, that's how tough he is. That's how strong he is. And, um, and you know, he, he was – that tough and that strong, that is why he survived as long as he did. But that's kind of why we thought, like, he, he'd live forever. You know, he seemed bulletproof to me. Like, it's if, if he didn't die by 1990, I didn't think he was ever going to die. And, um, and again, you know, that's certainly not me making light of anything. But, you know, the guy obviously was just incredibly tough. He was incredibly fit his entire life. Um, yeah, for sure. sure. One of the things I look for, you know, in these podcasts, you know, obviously we go all over the place with the gear and whatever, but also his personality. You know, I know he was in a bad spot then mentally, but I mean, you kind of alluded to his his kind of funny personality and it's and it's uh, he, you know, most of the people, including myself, who had a, just a moment with him, you get this feeling that he likes to put everybody at ease and get rid of the rock star thing that he has. Yeah. Is that the mm-hmm. way you perceive that? I did. Yeah, no, he was he was very normal. He was he was opinionated. It was gear stuff that was going on, and he was he was tough about the gear. And um and like I don't know if you know Seymour Duncan, but Seymour's a real sweet guy and kind of a sensitive guy. And really? Eddie would be kind of stern with him in terms of what he liked and what he didn't like about these pickups. And, and I don't, it's not my job to speak for Seymour and he and I never talked about this, but it seemed like it kind of threw him a little bit, seemed like it might've hurt his feelings. But aside from that, aside from him, he was very tough about the gear. He was really cool 
about everything else. And he was kind to everybody there at the factory. He went around, he met people, he took pictures with people. He was cool. Like he was, um, he was normal. And, and like you hear about how he's just, you know, very shy, very introverted and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure that's all true, right? People wouldn't say it otherwise, but he wasn't that way. He was just, you know, if he was totally shy and introverted, I would expect him just to sit in the corner and not talk to anybody, but he was walking around. He came up to my desk and said like, is this where you work? You know, <laughs> it's like, He doesn't need to ask me that. He doesn't know me. And yet it was the coolest thing ever. And so, yeah, he was, um, and he, and part of this may be my fanboy thing. And it probably is right. Because it's like, he's a legend, you know, he's a legend. He's my hero. That's my hero right there but he really does seem like he just exudes this sort of rock star otherness you know that he just has this power about him and and again easily could be projection on my part but i'll i'll tell you it's happened only two other times in my career i've met like a lot of my heroes right so i've never met paul mccartney right but um i met ringo so i met a beetle um i met almost everybody I wanted to meet because of my, just my job and my career, right? The only times I've truly been starstruck by people, the biggest one was Jeff Beck, where I met him. I met him on my birthday, 1999, and I could not speak in front of this guy. And he just exudes this power and it's real. And when I was really embarrassed and told Jennifer Batten that this happened and like, I'm going, I think I kind of embarrassed myself. Like I couldn't talk in front of him. And she goes, I've, I've spoken to a lot of really heavy people who've told me the exact same thing. And, and so I think it's real with Beck. And then strangely, and maybe it's not that strange because I'm a huge fan of this guy, but John Schofield mm. met John Schofield. And I'm just going like, Oh my gosh, this guy's got it. He's got this rock star energy he you know doesn't throw his weight around he's totally cool like you send him an email he'll email you right back he's normal but to be in his presence i'm going something's going on here and so i talked to a buddy of mine a guitar player and he said the same thing he's going like man was that like almost kind of weird with sco like he he's got this rock star energy and i'm going he totally does so so anyway um eddie van halen had that for me and yet he is such a singular person in my thing that I can't tell you if if that's actually true. But like, you know, it's I whatever. I hung out with Steven Tyler and it was just normal. And we talk about the weather. You know what I mean? And so and, and I dig Steven Tyler. I think he's great. And he is a rock star. I didn't get this same like, oh, my gosh, kind of thing. Um with that, or honestly, with anybody else that I've met, but yeah, with Eddie, I did, and and yet, you know, he's just—you almost have to take him out of the discussion. Like he's he's that huge, he's that special. I would never claim to know anything about this. You know, it's just he's he's too huge for that. So yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of people. I mean, you know, a lot of people been up there that have been, you know been on here that have been to the studio hung out with him for hours you know days some of them have worked with him uh for for extended periods and they all say the same kind of thing you know that it sort of disarm he likes to disarm you a little bit and be and, and if he if, what was it this one guy was a tennis pro that i that i that was at the smithsonian i met and i had him back later after the we like five years later we kind of reconvened on here to talk about that night and but he was a tennis pro and so his connection with Eddie Van Halen was through another, through his producer. So he wasn't really an industry person and he wasn't really a guitar player, much of a guitar player, but he got to go to the house, you know? And when Eddie found out he didn't really know much about, it, you know, like he liked that. He liked that. He didn't know much about it. Like, right. I, he like I think he even said, I like you already. <laughs> you don't know. Anything. That's funny. I mean, he said that. Well, Eddie's got a good uh, tennis connection, you know, John McEnroe and Vetus Gerolitis in those uh, Kramer ads back in the day. And this guy was close with all those people. That's what, there was one of the connections. There. Yeah. So they, I get that. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. 
was but yeah, he, he again, the very first thing he ever said to me is that I was not a student of his, which is absurd on its face because <laughs> of course I am, right? I wouldn't be here if I weren't. But it was really cool and it was um it was cool. Like he he did, he leveled the playing field instantly where he just said you got 12 notes just like I do. Well, mine sound a little different than yours, but thank you for saying that. Um, but yeah, it was um it was cool. It was it was great and I'm I'm super grateful for it. It was I actually ended up leaving that job at Seymour Duncan like the very next day, not because of this or anything, but just because I wanted to go back to guitar player and and all that. And that was a great job when I had it, but that was kind of a bittersweet time, but um yeah, I'm even more grateful for the gig because I did get to have my one Van Halen hang. And um, yeah, I'll never forget it. And, um, and, and, you know, again, it was, it was great. It wasn't, it wasn't the way I thought it was going to go. And it wasn't what I always sort of built it up in my head to be. And yet there we go. There's my hang. And so yeah, I am I'm very grateful for it. Well, I can tell you, you know, you mentioned Seymour and uh, one night, that, this is funny because I was in at the NAMM show and I was watching somebody play in the lobby there at uh, Hilton and I turned around and there was Seymour. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. So I went over and talked to him because I, you know, I always admired him and that's all I use. I don't use DeMarzio. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, DeMarzio. But Seymour's always been my pickup and I went over and talked to him and the guy was as sweet as he could be. I mean... Now he's he might be the nicest guy in the music business. I mean, and I, you know, so, I, I love that when you find people who are so successful that don't carry a lot of baggage with them. Right. You know, they're, they're, he truly does not. He's he's really cool. He's always open to asking questions. Uh, he's a lifelong learner. Uh, obviously, he knows more about pickups than anyone in history, and his stories are just amazing. And he, he's got a story about everyone. And the, like, you know, that Frankenstein guitar that I have behind me, I had that down here. There's a picture of me in the Duncan thing where I'm holding mine and I'm holding Eddie's there. Right. And so um, it, because they brought the real one to Duncan there and just left it like in the room, we locked the room, but like it's in there, you know, and it's like, that's a million dollars right there. You know, how can you do this? And it wasn't playable or anything. And so, did you hold it up though? I did. And so, yeah. how, how heavy was it? God, I don't remember because I was kind of panicking at the time. So, I, I think about the same as mine, which is like a normal weight. I don't remember it being heavy. If it was, maybe it was. I don't know. Um, I don't remember it being super light, but it was. It wasn't in playable condition then, but I still just thought it was so cool. And then I realized like mine was so clean compared to that one. That one was filthy, right? Just absolutely filthy. And um, and so anyway, it was like, I guess it was a couple days prior to that or something. I was playing that guitar of mine in the sound room and Seymour came in there and he said, uh, he goes, hey, uh, you should let me wind a pickup for that. I know. I know exactly what the pickup is. And I just, and this has a Duncan 59 in it. Right. And I said, man, this guitar is kind of perfect. Like I, 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 I've sort of vowed I'm not going to change anything on this guitar. And so he listens to me play it for a second and he goes, yeah, that guitar sounds great. He walks out. And then I realized what a fool I'd been. And I'm going, Seymour would have wound me a pickup by hand for this guitar. I could keep this freaking 59 in a drawer. I could always put it back in if I needed to. So I never had the guts to ask him, like, hey, man, is, does that offer still stand? Can you want me to pick up for this thing? <laughs> but that guitar does sound great. It's It sounds amazing. And uh, and the 59 gets the job done. You know, it's not terribly far off from what he had. Yeah, pickups in his line. I had the, a lot of times back 15 years ago when everybody was kind of doing, like, Van Halen links and stuff like that. People were talking about the custom custom, the custom five. And right. I, have, I have a custom five in my first replica, and it's it's amazingly close. It's it's shocking. that's a good sounding pickup. Yeah. yeah, and you know what's funny is that one has a slight dip in the mids to it, and yet these guitars are very mid rangey, and so maybe that's not 
a bad thing. And um, and yeah, I don't know, you know, there's so much folklore about that. I, I played an actual Van Halen guitar. Uh, this photographer, John Popplewell, brokered a deal and Eddie had given the guitar to like a tech. The tech had sold it to, I think, Mick Mars. And then Mick Mars was selling it to somebody in the Bay Area. And so Papa Wall brings it by the guitar player offices just to show us before he delivers it, which is really kind. He didn't have to do that. And so I remember playing that one and it had what looked like a hand potted PAF in the bridge. And um, and this was like a Kramer era Frankenstein replica. Um, and and the pickup squealed wildly, you know, so it like kind of seemed like hand potted PAF. And that's what it looked like. But then talking to George Tripps, he's going like, no, you'd be surprised at like what pickups go into which guitars. And when Eddie talked about using a DiMarzio magnet underneath a PAF or something, that's almost like the bastard child of a PAF and super distortion. And like the, I think the pickup in the Destroyer was a hot pickup and and that's Tripp's thing is that he's going like, man, how are you going to get that much gain out of these amps that don't have that much gain? It's got to be a hot pickup. It's got to be like a super distortion. And so I don't know, but I can believe it, you know. And then I, as far as I can tell, though, like by Diver Down, it sounds to me like he's using really low output pickups because those tones are like pretty clear and pretty jangly. There's a clip uh, that I found online of 84. He's kind of soloing just by himself and it's very clean mm -hmm. it's during this regular solo, but he's kind of jamming with his brother yeah. and it's really clean. I mean, you know, for that time frame, it was amazing. Yeah. And there's some bootlegs early on where the entire tone is very clean. And it's like, I don't know if that's when he, he lost his amps. And so he was touring with other amps. There were times when he had to tour with Laney's and he had to tour with like music man amps or something like that. And, uh, and I don't know, but it's, I mean, you know, he always sounds like himself and it always sounds great. And it's actually kind of cool. I like, I like a lot of the tones that are a little bit more naked, you know, cause you just can kind of hear what's going on. You hear the pick on the strings a little bit more. Yeah. I like the, I do, you know, as I've gotten older too, like everybody seems like they kind of like go back a little bit on the game, you know, like everybody seems to move, move back a little bit to clear it up a little bit to hear it better. I don't know if we get deafer and we need to hear it more. Or what? Like well, I, I think with most people, it's the exact opposite. And a lot of guitarists I really like, and I, Eddie was one of them, they went with more and more game and more and more effect later in their career. And like, I think Neil Sean does that and... Uh, and like Carlos and he, like a lot of these guys, I wish they'd go back to their earlier tones. I just heard like some not super early Neil Sean. I like the stuff of Steve Perry, but it was like the evolution record or something. And it's like, God, the tones were just amazing. Whereas now, you know, I see him on Instagram and everything and he's awesome and he's a huge influence on me. And so I'm certainly not saying anything bad about Neil Sean, but man, there's a lot of game and there's a lot of effect on that tone. And, um, but I've seen him play, you know, like I, I, he got into this big fight online about somebody gave him a hard time about being Mr. Effects or whatever. And I saw him sit in with on the Paul Reed Smith booth one day, mm -hmm. straight up dry, you know, basically bone dry. Sounds just like Neil Sean. <laughs> yeah. Well, he can certainly do it. He's such a great player. And, um, but it's like, I think we all like our comfort zone a little yeah. too much. And so, you know, for me, it's I will absolutely put delay and chorus on my tone when I'm um, or delay and reverb rather. I don't use as much chorus as I used to. And uh, and I'll play with that. But then when I record, I realize like, no, none of that stuff works. I strip almost all of it away and then just add a touch afterwards. But um, but yeah, so I'm guilty. I'm not judging. It could be, though, you know, with the uh, in-ears as, as they've gone that direction, you know, for me, when I play now with the ears, which is almost all the time. Just having that space in them, you know, having the, the effects and the reverb and having it in stereo and having it as wide as you can get it to get you to get you away from that kind of like sterile. Dry. Right. You just it, it, I can't stand it in here to be dry. And uh, yeah, so that I'm doing the fractal, too. And, and I've been using it for about two years now. And it, it took a lot of like working with 
the alignment on the speakers to get the, the phase so it felt like there was space in there you know what i mean that sure. really helps it helps helps live and i know he's he's been trying to deal with his hearing issues that of course we all have because we all have blasted back in the day but <laughs> he's been trying to keep it down i think as well so yeah, but he was like, you know, he, I, I think he liked what I said. I was like, well, I'm just saying, you know, I've seen you do it any way you want to do it. And you, yeah, I know you can do it whatever, but this is how you prefer it. You know, so that's fine. But but about the tapping thing and, and um, you know, the history of that tapping technique. Now, there's I just found the Brian May song everybody talks about from 77 that he plays tapping. And it, right. sounds, it sounds very much like, a, a, you know, the tapping on, um, what is it? One of those women and children first songs oh no 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 it's on no you're no good i kind of that's one of the that's first right. songs. no it's very much like the you're no good solo yeah you get that kind of across the strings with the bending and then tapping very much yes. good, that kind of vibe but more complex now harvey mandel which i found these videos today of was doing a very similar kind of vibe to that and they say it was way back and blackmore said he saw Harvey Mandel playing at the whiskey and he saw him tap. Jim Morrison was in there giving the band a hard time. They threw him out and Jimi Hendrix was there watching too. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, this is what's interesting. And this is why I don't know what to make of any of this stuff because my buddy, Art Thompson at guitar player did an interview with Harvey Mandel and so I asked him to ask him about the tapping stuff. Like, let's see if we can get drilled down on this a little bit. And he claims Harvey told him that he was doing a gig and Eddie Van Halen and Jimi Hendrix were there. Okay, well, that's clearly impossible, right? So he's he either misspoke or he's not remembering this properly or whatever. And then I guess... I, I don't know. I don't know nearly enough about Harvey Mandel's tapping stuff to know, like, was he doing it back when Hendrix was still alive? Like he was tapping in 69 or 1970? Lightmore said 68 at the whiskey with Hendrix. Okay. I mean, that's what Lightmore said. I don't know. I used to think that these, this evidence of tapping pre Van Halen was like totally rare. Right. And then I've realized like, no, it's actually not that rare. Like a bunch of people did it, but the ones that I would talk about would be, Brian May on It's Late on the News of the World record, uh, which is just great. Right. And then and I asked him why he never did it again after that. And he said, well, I suppose Edward ruined it for all of us. And um, oh, like he made the conscious decision after that, that not to do that. Anymore. Yeah, he did. And yet I think he <laughs> done one more time. There may be a tune off like Queen's Innuendo record where he taps. And I remember hearing it, and yet now I'm not going to know what the song is. And so don't quote me on that. But I think he may have done it one more time. But then not really. really um, he did it on, uh, what's that one song that, that was uh, from the movie? Not Flash, but there was another movie song. And he did tap one other song for sure later on. And that okay. was... Okay, you that may was, know more about it than I do. That was, much oh. more, that was much more Eddie Van Halen on that particular song. But... Uh, of course, he did Starfleet with him, which just came out again. Right. Um, so so there was that. There was um, Larry Carlton taps one note on the Kid Charlemagne solo. Okay, so that's kind of hilarious. And um, then he, Brian May got it from someone in a bar band that said he got it from Billy Gibbons. And so I think the Billy Gibbons tapping thing is on Beer Drinkers and Hellraisers. And so he did that. But then you go back and you can find Roy Smack and you can find um, Segovia and like classical guitarists did right hand on the fretboard a long time ago. And the Roy Smack stuff is like really cool. He does it like on a ukulele. And it's like, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it's super cool. And so, so there's that. There's Steve Hackett. Steve Hackett was doing, you know, like he and Harvey Mandel were the guys that did the triplets. And so that's what's a little bit weird. It's not just hitting one note. It's they're actually doing the arpeggios with it. And um, and then my thing was just like, A, it's totally possible that Eddie just came up with it on his own, right? And so I, so I never want to totally discount that. 
but I don't believe he got it from Jimmy Page, right? And um, and he certainly didn't get it from Jimmy Page, but he was just watching the um, whatever whole lot of love solo or something, and, and like going, oh, if you had a an extra finger, you could go anywhere with that, right? And so then this makes sense, and um, and so that's possible. I don't buy it. And then just the George Lynch thing to me just sounds really compelling. When I just I asked him straight up, do you think that's where Eddie got it? And he goes, Well, that's where I got it. Well, come on. You know, that's gotta be it. That's got to be it. So that's that's certainly what I would put my money on. It doesn't matter. I think we just find it fascinating as fans. And I think it's really cool. I think it's funny because Eddie never copped to it. And um, and I'm not trying to do like a gotcha thing with him because where do I get off with that, right? But um, but it's just yeah, because like you, I'm fascinated by this. I've thought about it a lot. It's the most likely explanation. I think it is. You have three sources that said, you know, we got Terry Kilgore who said he taught it to him because he went and took a lesson from Harvey Mandel. Chris Holmes backs that up. You got George Lynch saying, I saw him with Harvey Mandel at the club. You got Harvey Mandel saying he came to the club. Right. <laughs> I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, and he never mentions Harvey Mandel once. <laughs> never. never once. And it's it's really funny. And in that, it's like it, that it makes it like something out of the movies where they're, the, 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 the hero's never going to give their the ultimate secret away. Ever, right? They'll take it to their grave with them. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I don't know. That's that's what I believe. Uh, and there's a part of it that just kind of makes me happy just to think that. I don't know. Um, but yeah. but ultimately, I don't care, right? It doesn't matter. And yeah, like, but it's, it's true. Everybody says it, and it's totally true that Eddie Van Halen took this to a whole new level with a different, a different tone. It. You know, even the, the Harvey Mandel stuff that I was putting up earlier, uh, I haven't gone back to look at all the comments. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of hate, but, but you know, the bottom line is the um, the tone and and everything else that came with Eddie Van Halen, along with the tapping, which was kind of like the final piece. You know, once you we talked about that earlier about the eruption solo kind of transitioning from '76 to '77, and then eventually on the record, you know, he he had this huge change there as Roth did. If you listen to Roth's vocals on those bootlegs or even the songs that they came, like you were talking about earlier, how they would move things around. Like this was the chorus. This There's a, there's a bootleg. I think it's Voodoo Queen, right? Where he's singing the verse over the pre-chorus, which is on Mean Street. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's in a different spot. Totally. So there was a huge amount of, of adjustment. And I don't know how much Ted Templeman had an effect on the final places of those pieces, but it all came together. It was, yeah, it did. I mean, it's just amazing, right? It did, and and you you said it best when it's like it doesn't matter who did this before him; he is the guy that owns this. And I remember I was in my office, a guitar player, and this really well respected author who I will not name came into my office, and I had a life size Eddie Van Halen cardboard cutout, the PV one. Right. And so that was just in my office. So he lived I, in my office. I have that back there right there. And it's my room back there. Okay. That's hilarious. You know? And so um, then uh, I gave mine away. Uh, I gave it to Johnny Bean, I think. Oh, and so I think he has my cardboard okay. cutout now. Right. And so I had that there. I had a Van Halen poster. I had a Slows Hour picture that Neil had signed there. And then I had a Van Halen picture that Eddie had signed there. Right. So it's pretty clear whose office you're walking into here. It's pretty clear this person is a Van Halen fan. And this author just goes like, yeah, you know, he uh, loves to take credit um, for that tapping thing. But he goes, so, you know, a lot of people did tapping before some uh, punk kid in a kegger band in Pasadena. And I just cut him off and I said, change the world with it. <laughs> right. and I'm just going like, are you? Kid, hey, don't ever say that ever. Don't say that to me, right? Again, I have a life-size cardboard cutout there. It's like, gee, do you think maybe you're going to offend this person with that one? And it's such a lame take. It's like, 
oh yeah, no, 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 no. We all love, you know, and again, no disrespect to Steve Hackett, you know, who's a great player. Please, please. And so it's, yeah, he changed the world. He he changed our entire lives. And again, it, like I said in that story in mine, which is how we're doing this, it's like, we wouldn't be talking right now if it weren't for Eddie Van Halen. You and I would not know one another if it weren't for Eddie Van Halen. I mean, how cool is that? You know, I say that all. I seems like I say that almost every episode. That that you know, I wouldn't be meeting any any of you people if it wasn't for this guy's inspiration. I mean, everything that he gave us, it just it, it keeps that like that thing you're talking about that community thing that we we all share. You know, all of the people like Johnny B and myself, and all the people that that are are huge supporters and fans and we want to keep uncovering like these things that eddie didn't ever say <laughs> we want to continue to i mean you know maybe that was the whole idea of these things where he didn't say anything i was like keep the mystery you know i think his brother always said would led zeppelin do that would they you know that that was his thing it was like they're going to keep the mystique that was sort of something they always wanted to do and you know if eddie tried to show the you really got me to the wrong guys and angel. He got in trouble for that. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's funny. And you know, I, I interviewed that guy, Punky Meadows, and I'm just going, I'm sure you're sick of talking about this. And he goes, Yeah, I am. But he goes, I'll say it again. And he goes, No, we didn't do that. We didn't try and do a rush release of this. And I wouldn't have done he denies that entire story. So something got completely blown out of proportion with that. But um, but that's funny. It's like Man, that's a guy who like kind of did some things, and all he's known for is the dude that got that tried to release "You Really Got Me" before Van Halen. Hey, that's a, that's an amazing story. Yeah, that, that there's a there's one thing that I was hit today this morning, and I I've hit it a few times in October or I think it's October of '77. They play Magic Mountain, and this bootleg does not have tapping on it. This is after you hear it in June. So I, I was always wondering why he didn't tap that one time. It's like, well, I mean, it, this is when you really are like the archaeologist of this, and so you know way more about it than I do. And I have no, I have no answer for that. I, I kept just thinking, I kept thinking, well, maybe this is around the, the the angel thing, and they were like, no more until we get the record out. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that actually that would be very funny. We are sending the disc to the radio stations now. You. <laughs> Do not tap another tap. Because, <laughs> you know, Eddie was pretty, apparently pretty open with his friends and he would share those tapes and all those people were sworn to secrecy. They were like, they tell me that, like that we'd be able to hear it, but, but he would like get them back from us. And they, and they were like, you know, you, you put this out, you die. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Steve Rosen book tell, tells a lot of those stories of where, but he would just bring a boom box there and then they'd, you know, ride around in the car with a boom box and he would play them. I mean, total rough mixes, no vocals on them. I mean, crazy stuff. Like, it must have been incredibly exciting to hear that. Yeah, I just interviewed uh, Carl Jaw, which was Dred Zeppelin's guitar player. Oh, yeah. I know that guy well. Yeah, Carl. Well, Carl was there a lot during the early days with, with Eddie, okay? And and uh, Jimmy Bates from Stormer was one of his big heroes. And he would play the Megazone like Jimmy did. Jimmy was left-handed, played a left-handed Megazone. But, but uh, Carl still got a right-handed Megazone. And he brought it out on our thing, and uh, we were talking about uh, all of those, all those details. You know, with, with Stormer and all these bands around him, and it was, it was a really interesting thing to go back through with him. All those details, yeah, it's crazy, but yeah, this crazy stuff, man. Well, I appreciate you getting on here and talking about Van Halen with me, man. It's been awesome. I, I mean, it's been my pleasure, and I, I realize like I'm just babbling. I, I, I go into these things. Where I'm going, like God, you know, what am I going to have to say after the first 20 minutes? And then here we are, two hours in. <laughs> it's like right, I'm right. still going. So thank you um, for for just having me. And I apologize if I babbled too much. I didn't mean. Oh, to. not at all, man. I really appreciate you coming on. You know, and this issue, you know, for for all of us, will live on and live on, and it lives on in my house. At least a couple copies are here now, and will stay with me as long as I can. Well, thank you so much for that. You know, and again, it's like that again was one of my proudest moments, you know, at the incredibly sad time. But like, I, I, I'm still honored that they trusted me to do it. And I, I, I like the fact that people like it. Yeah, you know, they the uh, Van Halen News Desk, who I followed for years and years and years, uh, and I, I met Jeff uh, over those years. They, they recently asked me to be part of their contributing 
writers team and i'm not a, i've never been a writer you know so i was like was really honored to to be involved at all and be able to to do you know like the nuno article i did i did you know i really thought that he hit so many home runs on that interview with rick beato i had to make sure that that got out to everybody in our community because there's that great story at the end too with paul mccartney that's just <laughs> No, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, I was the first person he told that Paul story to, oh, and he yeah? wouldn't let me put it in guitar player. And <laughs> uh, and so it's it's an amazing story. He's just a good dude, and I let him close this story. I didn't know it was going to go that way, but his quotes were just so beautiful and poignant. I'm going, this is it. This is the closer here. So it's you know, I mean, I have my closing paragraph, but he's the last artist that I quote in there. Yeah, he he. Uh the way that he came across on that was so powerful for, for especially ready. You know, he was, he was so, you know, some people are like, you know, you're writers and, and, and then you have people like Nuna who are storytellers in, in that way, you know, that can just put it across in a, in a very powerful condensed way, you know? Yeah. It's amazing like that. One other thing I want to say real quick before we go, you had mentioned Malmsteen and your, and your relationship with him. Um, I've met him. And I'm going to try to help out with Malmsteen's reputation. <laughs> I've met him multiple times, and every time he was great to me. And I'll tell everybody that, but because I've told people that for years. But, uh, you know, I'm glad you had a good experience with him, too. Yeah. No, I really did. I really did. And, you know, I made it pretty easy on him as softball questions and all this. But, no, I think I think a lot of his stuff, I think he had a lot of attitude early in his career. Yeah. I think a lot of things got taken out of context. And then I think he had he had some times where he probably had a fairly antagonistic relationship with people who might be talking to him. But I think at the end of the day, he's just a guitar freak who has this incredible gift, has a very healthy ego, even though, you know, he didn't he didn't come off as egoed out to me. You know, it's a, it's kind of like some some power lifter who says he can bench press 500 pounds. It's not bragging if you can do it. And, and so with Ingve, it's like, it's not bragging. He can do this stuff. You don't have to like what he does, but there's nobody else like him. And, um, and to be candid, I don't spin the records or anything. I don't find the tunes to be that hummable, but I love watching him play. I've seen some mind boggling gigs with him. And I just, I think he's, he's a, a singular talent. And, you know, I wouldn't want anybody else to play like him, but I'm glad he does it. Uh, you know, that sort of thing when you said with Beck, you know, I think the same thing with Inve. Like, it's something you you got to see. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it, it's only it's only real when you see it. And, and I agree with that. And it's the record will never convey it. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, no, you know, he's... <laughs> He's good. Uh, it's a, I, I consider myself a fan, even if I don't spin the records. Yeah, he, his sound is visceral a lot. I mean, it's obviously yeah, blessed, it is. but it, it's a beautiful tone. It's a great tone. No, it's and that's why it works so well. I saw that Generation X tour, and everybody was a great player. Everyone, obviously. So it's him, and it's Nuno, and Tosin, and Vi, and, um, and um, I told Nuno that I thought he and Ingve were the best there even though everybody was great and it's partly because they were up in the mix so prominently Ingve's guitar was louder than the freaking snare drum and it was an unbelievable tone and so you heard every nuance and even though like Vi who I'm a huge fan of he played great that night he wasn't loud enough and it's like now that's like there's something about it and so Ingve just again through sheer force of Ingveness, you know, was up loud and proud and uh, yeah. And so he was great. And so I do think seeing him live is totally different than listening to him on the record for yeah, sure. It's like the Beck thing. You, you kind of capture Beck in a record, but it, it, I don't know. I never saw him live, but I, but I get it, you know, like watching. Yeah. Well, and he, he and I talked about that and he said himself that it's like, it's the records never, never can capture what is in the live performance. And the only tune he thought came close was goodbye pork pie hat. And he said, yeah, I thought that's pretty good. That's not too bad. Okay. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that's true. Um, 
Certainly true with him. And that's what's so crazy about people like Van Halen. And I would also say like Stevie Ray Vaughan, most blues guys, the record can't capture them. But you go see them live and you're going like, oh my gosh, this guy's great. You buy a record and you're going, eh, you know, it's like, it's not the same. Stevie's records were always amazing, right? So he's like, in my mind, one of the few blues guys who really did capture it in the studio. Eddie captured it every single time in the studio. It was always better live. It was always amazing live, but man, the records, they still hold up. They work, you yeah, know? And it was that, like is you, a, that is a magic power of the Van Halen, especially the first. You know, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Well and it's, and it's, it's very difficult to do that. You know, most bands can't. And that's part of why they went with Ted Templeman, right? Because of what he did on that first Montrose record. And like, I was a huge Montrose fan. Ronnie never captured his magic the same way as that first Montrose record. Right. But I'd go see him live and it was like killer. It was amazing, right? And so then you get the records and you're going, eh, kind of by comparison, a little two-dimensional. And it's not um, not the same. And um, But those Van Halen records, man, every time. It's like it's like being there. It's like being at a concert. Hey, what, I don't know how they do it. One of the things, too, just one other person I want to talk about is Brian May, because I'm such a huge fan, like you are, of both, both of them. Um, you know, you met Brian. What what did you how was that? That was amazing. He was he's so cool. We'd spoken on the phone a bunch before I ever met him in person, and he was always incredibly kind and gracious. And and you know, I showed up prepared. I know a lot about his career, so he enjoyed the interviews. We didn't have to cover the same stuff that everybody covered. And so he was always really cool about that. And then the first time I met him. I brought my Brian May guitar there for him to sign. I forgot to clean it before. And so it was like all dusty and bad sweat on it and all this. And I just said, man, the reason it's so filthy is because I actually play it and gig with it. And, you know, he didn't care. He signed it. It was all cool. And then I met him again when he did his uh, book on stereo photography, which he's always been fascinated by. And I always have been too, right? I'm a big Viewmaster guy. And so... It was just an incredibly cool hang. I gave him a Viewmaster from my own personal collection. And, you know, the dude's got, what, a billion dollars in the bank, you know, and he was so happy that I gave him this little toy and uh, and just couldn't get over it. And like a little kid, he's just, you know, going through the reels and everything. And so it was just, it was awesome. And like, we have, we have just a cool relationship. I occasionally will send him an email he always writes me back. He's always like super gracious. And, uh, and yeah, I just, it's, I couldn't love him more, you know? And like, I, I normally don't gush super hard on interviews because it's just kind of not what you're supposed to do. And like, I have a job to do and, and, you know, the Jazz Obrecht school is like, no, you don't go fanboy on these people. You actually will do a worse job if you do that. And I think he's right. But first time I talked to Brian May. I got through the story, did the story, handled my business. I was a professional, got the story. And then we're finishing up. And I just said, hey, I um, I don't do this very often, but I just, I have to tell you that only the Beatles and Van Halen have had the impact on my music that you and your bandmates have had. And I just, I've always wanted to thank you. And I just want to say thank you. And he was so cool and so humble with it and said it was an honor to even be on that list. And like, it was just perfect. You know, it's like you, you, you meet your hero and he's actually a hero, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, I just, I couldn't love him more, you know? So, um, yeah, th there you go. I'll say the same thing about Eddie Van Halen. When, uh, when I met him in 2015, you know, he was in much better shape and really at the peak of where, you know, we all would want him to be, you know what I mean? And I think it was that moment where it's the same thing. I went up to him and I just said, you know, I've been waiting 30 years to tell you thanks. And I've been wanting to tell you thanks for 30 years. And I had an opportunity in 91 to shake your hand, but I didn't tell him this, but at that, at the Biff's thing, right at NAMM, he's in front of me. I'm 20, like two. He's standing there in front of me at the end. I'm on the very front and he's trying to shake everybody's hands. And I'm right there and I freeze. I couldn't shake his hand. So it took until 2015 to finally tell him thanks, to finally have a moment with him. And he was just like you said, you, you would with Brian. It was like your hero was everything you expected and more. What a great story. That's awesome. It's like, I love that story. 
I know it didn't happen all the time with him, but you know, that, that time frame was just the right time. And that night, you know, that was a big night for him and, you know, uh, Brad and, and Chris were there and they, they call it one of his greatest nights of all time, you know, since he really had that moment where he got to talk and have an interview live and I, that never right. happened, you know, so that was pretty cool. Pretty cool to be wow. But thanks for being with me, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for the time. You know, it's this is great. It's good. It's, I'm happy to do it and I really appreciate your work. So, you know, again, my pleasure. Thank you so much. It comes from, from a guy like you who writes such great stuff like this, man. I really appreciate that. Seriously. In the future, I might do some roundtables. I'd like to have you someday, maybe for one of those. What do you think of that? Yep. You just let me know. I will make myself available. Everybody, I appreciate your time. You have a great rest of the night. Same and, to you. Uh, Thanks and again. I'll, and I'll send you a link when we get this thing edited and put together. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you, buddy. Have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>